please don't tell me you're still using console log to debug your application. If you never use a debugger, imagine being able to run the code line by line, where you can see all values of your variables at any given time. You can run some extra code to validate your assumption, you can post the code only if a condition is met, and much more. I mean, everyone does that, I use console logs too sometimes, but Chrome has a perfectly working debugger. No configuration required and it just works. Okay, cool, but how does it work? Well, my name is Leonardo and I talk about web development and open source every week. Join me today as we go through the Chrome debugger and how you can debug efficiently your JavaScript application with this amazing tool. Let's use this simple React application. Where can I find the debugger? Well, just press F12 in your keyboard and you will open the console, which you might already know. You know, probably the network tab, but this time we go on sources. Here you can find this SRC folder with components. And what is that? Well, this is exactly the same folder structure I've got here on VS Code. So from here, I can just open a file and I can find the code. But if I use my application now, I can see that, well, nothing happens here. So how can I start using it? Well, let's say we want to debug when our users click here in the grid. How can we do that? We can add a breakpoint inside the handle click function. And what is a breakpoint? Basically, every time the code reaches this line, as you can see here it says pose in debugger. So everything poses and from here you can go step by step and inspect your code. I will go into these buttons later. But the question is, sometimes you do not exactly know where you want to set a breakpoint in order to inspect your code. But the Chrome tools also have these event listener breakpoints. You can basically set a breakpoint, not on a specific line, but after an event is triggered on your browser. For example, you can open mouse, you can select click, and here, every time the mouse clicks in your application, if there's a listener attached to it, the execution will pose on that listener. Again, for example, if I click on go to move tree, you will see that here the execution posed inside game.tsx under on click on this button. And as you can see in the code is basically the list of the moves. If you're not satisfied yet, there's even a third method, which I don't really recommend, but you better know it. And it's basically adding the keyword debugger right into your code. As you can see, ESLint already suggests it as an error because you better not commit debugger in your production code but it's a quick way to open the debugger exactly on that line that is probably the line you're working on on VS Code. The cool thing is that if your Chrome DevTools are closed, that breakpoint will not get triggered. But if you have the DevTools open and the execution of the code jumps on that debugger, well, there you have it. The debugger opens exactly on that line you specified on VS Code. Now that we're in the debugger, what can we do from here? Well, first of all, let me resume the execution with this button here and I can move on board and set a breakpoint, for example, here inside this for loop. If I click, for example, here, well, we still have this debugger. I'm going to remove it. That's actually why you should never use the debugger keyword because it's so annoying. Okay. This is where I set my breakpoint and here under scope, you can see the definition and the values of the variables I can get access to. For example, A, B, and C are still undefined here. I is at zero, and you can also find that by hovering the mouse above the variable or the constant. And I also got reference to the local variables, also module, and global ones. Let me close this for now. You can see here, A, B, or C are undefined. So if I move by one line, you can now see that the values are 0, 1, and 2, that are basically lines, that is this constant, and the index 0. With this, you can easily debug because instead of having a dozen console logs logging every kind of value, you just have all of them here. And that's not everything. You can use the watch tab, and here you can basically write expressions. For example, you see that I've got the lines array here. If I type lines, you can see here that is an array of eight elements. But here you cannot just specify values, but you can write whatever expression you want to. So we can say that I want to check 
what is on the element at the index tree of lines. And there you have it, 0, 3, 6. And also, you can go even further because here you can just type, for example, map and for each number returns x plus 1. And again, here you will find an array of 1, 4, 7. This is basically 0, 3, 6 plus 1. So this was a simple example, but you get the idea. You can basically do whatever you want here and you can map an array. You can test a, for example, i equals to a number you're trying to test. For example, is i equals to 4? No, it's false. I mean, you can find here is 0, but again, you get the idea. But now we're stuck in this for loop. And that's probably time to go a little bit deeper on these buttons over here. And as you can see, the first button you're gonna find is resume script execution, which is also here in the header of the page. What resume script execution does is basically resumes the execution and keeps going until it either finds a valid reason to stop, for example, a breakpoint, or if we click it, it goes until the end of the execution without stopping at all. But let's also check the other ones. Okay, we have a clean state. Now I want to pose here, I add a debugger, I click on the grid, and I'm on this line. If I want to go to the next instruction, I can use step over next function call. That is also shown here. Basically, those are the two buttons you'll probably use most of the time. And by the way, they also have keyboard bindings. So these are the ones on Mac and also Windows have their own binding. Now I want to go to the next line so I can use this one to jump over that. I want to go again forward. Okay. And now I'm on this on play method call. But this time I do not want to jump to next winner, but I want to actually go inside on play. Well, that's the second button you can find on the list. Step into next function call. So with this button, I basically go inside the on play function. But here you can see that it's handle play is a different one. How did I get here? Well, you can find here in the call stack, what is the stack of the function that have been called? For example, here I'm inside handle play, which was called by handle click, which again was called by on square click. So basically I click on a square, this trigger, this on square click handler, which calls handle click, which again has this function inside, which calls on play, which is actually coming from here, from the props of this component. And on play is basically this function handle play, which you can find probably here. Back to our pointer, we can again keep jumping by one line, or if we're done in this function, you can manually step out of this function. So what do you expect to happen here? I'm inside this handle play function, which was called by handle click on line 25 of board. So if I step out of handle play, I might expect myself to find inside handle click. And this is exactly what happened. I previously was on line 25 when I entered on play, I stepped out and the execution continued until the next line after the function I was in. And again, I'm now on line 26. I can either jump to the next line here, that will be line 27, or I can step into the function that is also highlighted here, that is calculate winner. So if I step into, I find again myself inside this function. So what happens if you do not manually exit from a function? Well, I can just jump here. I can resume my application. So it stops on this breakpoint. And here, if I keep going until I reach the return, I can just tap over and keep going with my execution. Oh, I almost forgot. Instead of manually searching for files here in case your application is quite big, you have the common palette. For example, with command P on Mac, I think it should be like control P on Windows, or maybe control P is print. Anyway, on Mac is command P, I can open the common palette and here, for example, I can type board and jump into the board file. I can type game and again, I'm on game.tsx. 
And you can also find here some tabs, which are useful if you're switching between files. You can toggle the left and right columns if you want more space. And yeah, there are quite some cool features in order to handle all this stuff. Speaking of breakpoints, we see that we can select a line and the execution will pause in that specific line. We can resume and go to those lines, but imagine being inside a loop. Well, if you put a breakpoint here, you'll find yourself cycling through each iteration of the loop. Every time I click, I click, this keep going. So what can I do to better control this breakpoint? Well, if I right click, I can find edit breakpoint and this becomes a conditional breakpoint. So it stops only if the condition is met. For example, again, I want to stop only if I is at four. And now you can see here the breakpoint has changed color. If I click, it stops only once and I is four. So now if I resume, instead of keep cycling through each iteration, I just go until the end because this breakpoint was exactly set to stop only when the code execution goes on this line and there's a variable i which has value 4 as you can again see from here. But that's not the only type of breakpoint you might have because here there's also log point which is basically your beloved console log but without actually writing anything in the code. Here, if I delete this, you can see that it suggests to log a message. For example, I can use this string, i is, and I can concatenate the value. What happens here? Again, it changed color. If I open the console and I, for example, click here, you will see that it actually printed each iteration here with my value. What is the advantage here? Well, first of all, you can easily find where those logs are and you don't fall into the risk of actually having to write the log, how to remove it before committing or pushing your code, having many console logs spread around your code. You just use them here and when you're done, the log disappeared and nothing happened. What happens if you have many breakpoints here and there. Well, you have some kind of control on breakpoints because here you can see all of them listed. You can temporarily disable some of them so that you do not lose the position of the breakpoint, but the application does not stop there. You can obviously remove and re-enable and also delete one or delete all of them. And you can resume your application. This clearly works across multiple files. So I can have one on app, I can have one here and you have a nice list of all the breakpoints you have in your code with the line, you can jump to it. So again, there's quite some utility function you can use to actually inspect productively your code. There's also a quick shortcut here, which temporarily disables all of them, which is again, really, really helpful. After watching all these amazing features that debugger has, are you gonna still using console logs? Well, here's my answer. Yeah, sometimes I will. Or at least if it's just one console log printing a single value once, I can accept it. But as you find yourself writing two console logs or writing two or three variables, watching again the code, checking again the logs, well, maybe using the debugger will actually make you save a little bit of extra time. I mean, at first it might seem scary, all those buttons, steps into, step out, but as you get used to it, it's really simple and has a lot of value as it lets you run, again, every single line individually so that you get a better and deeper idea of how variables and values are moving across your application. And that was it for today. Thanks for watching this video. Again, my name is Leonardo and I talk about web development and open source with videos every week. So if you like this content, please subscribe so that you get notified about new videos or actually you can disable the notification but you get the videos in your YouTube homepage. And again, if you want to continue watching, you can find here a video specifically suggested for you by YouTube and here 
I don't know the subscribe button if you if you're lazy you want to click there and that was really everything thanks for watching and see you in the next video bye